our very last lecture for today uh, is about the missing piece of cloud security. It's from Elmer Kiss and Nicole Fishbein. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, shoot them out in our uh, Discord channel and I'll ask them after the talk. So, hey, hey, El, can you can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you great. Cool, oh, thank you. And Nicole, are you there? Is everything fine? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, folks. Uh, there you go. You can take it away. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I know that you've been here for a while. So <laughs> welcome to the missing piece of cloud security. We've got some whispering going by our moderator over there. <laughs> I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is El Marquez, and if you live in the Twitter world, you may know me as Elo Punk. I am the Linux security advocate. Actually, I guess I've just been changed over to the security advocate as I'm digging into DFIR as a, for a company called Inazer. I know security advocates a weird of a weird name, and it basically means I get to work with researchers like Nicole to ask a hundred questions and get to the point where I can come up with solutions to come and present to you. And occasionally I drag the researchers out of the research lab to come and present with me. So with that said, Nicole, say hi to everybody. Hello, uh, my name is Nicole and I'm a security researcher at Inzero. As part of our job is looking for new threats and new variants and analyze them and publish about them in our blog. So people in the community can better protect themselves and understand the threats. So here today we're going to talk about a missing piece in the cloud security. But for that, we need to understand, first of all, what is uh, the environment that we're talking about? So we talk about Linux. Linux is the most popular operation system for servers, and it's actually the most popular platform for cloud as well. Most of the cloud is running on top of Linux. Actually, uh, all of the, sorry, most of the supercomputers are running Linux as well. And the top websites are running on Linux as well. So Google, YouTube, Facebook, and so on. And only two websites, the big websites that are not uh, running on Linux, are actually uh, of Windows. So it makes sense. Oh, there's always the fun fact that 90% of 90, I wish, no, 50%, over 50%, there we go, over 50% of the servers running on Azure, that's Microsoft's cloud, basically, are running Linux. But even with all of that said, and maybe it's because I'm transitioning from Linux to just security advocate, we cannot forget the fact that look, Windows is still going to play a big part, even in the cloud. I mean, we saw how frequent um, their use is, even when we came to uh, malware such as WannaCry, which transcended both whether they're using cloud or on-prem servers. Um, in fact, a lot of companies are going to continue to rely on that hybrid method where you've got, let's say, web servers in the cloud, but you've got your enterprise servers you know, in um, on-prem and they're running Windows. And so unless we can talk about 100% conversion, when we talk to cloud security, we need to talk about both. But because of that, it enables attackers to be able to pivot from one to the other because, you know what, that, that's what attackers do, right? Their job is to gain persistency, not on just one box, but our environment. So, Nicole, though, there is one really big uh, comment that everybody makes, and that's... Um, so, some things still think that uh, viruses and malware don't attack Linux, and that's super not true and it's false <laughs> so as we said before linux is a super popular operation system and many users use it so attackers are um, understand the importance and the potential here so they pivot as well and most of the attacks that we see on linux is crypto jacking crypto jacking is unauthorized use of um, computers and services to mine cryptocurrency for profit other attacks that we see include botnets such as Kaiji, and actually we see ransomware attacking Linux as well. So, for example, we have Bash and our Evil. And our Evil is an interesting example because it shows how attackers understand that they have, for example, a malware for Windows, a ransomware in our Evil case. And now, as they want to target Linux, they actually shift their focus and they add Linux to their arsenal. So they created an R-Evil uh, sample for Linux. So some attackers will create new threads from scratch. They will develop new threads and new malwares. And uh, other attackers will 
just um, redesign existing malware to focus Linux as well. And there is a very useful tool for doing that, and that's GoLink. So GoLink is similar to C, a but not really. <laughs> it has a memory safety, garbage collection, it's faster, and there are many more uh, differences between Go and other languages. But the main thing about Go is that it's multi-platform, meaning that a developer can run, uh, sorry, can uh, write code and then just compile it to different platforms for Linux, or for Windows, and for Mac OS. So it saves time and it saves eventually money. So we see a huge increase in new malware written in Go. Um, and we think that it's going to, to increase over the years. Actually, a researcher from my team wrote an excellent white paper about malware in Go and what we saw and what we think is going to happen in the future. Um, I think that the white paper, should, white paper should be linked to the slides. Yeah, at the end, we're going to have a like resource, which is actually just my homepage with resources for you to be able to go in. And it's actually, um, what's the word? It's open source, right? It's hosted on GitLab. So if you have more you think other people should see, just jump on in and contribute. Okay, I'll shush now. <laughs> um, so interesting thing about the shift to GoLang. So we're not talking only about super advanced um, threat actors, APTs. APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. So we see Russian uh, nation state um, threat actors targeting, I'm um, sorry, using Golang for a Zebra C, for example, a Zebra C version, a well mess, and so on. But actually, less sophisticated attackers are shifting and using Go as well. We see examples as IP Store. So we see that there are threats in the cloud, right? They're tar targeting us, but there, is, there are ways to protect our cloud. And because cloud is, um, could be a little bit more complex, we have this responsibility model. Basically, it says that this, if, for example, I have an AWS instance, I'm responsible for all the code that is running on the instance. I'm responsible that the code will not contain malware or any malicious artifacts. AWS are responsible for all the infrastructure that makes my instance alive, if I can say, what makes it exist. So the hardware, the software, and so on. And besides that, how do I protect my instances? So there are many tools. There are some tools that are provided by the cloud providers and they cost money. And we have open source tools, many of them, and we have tools provided by third party vendors. But all the uh, tools have something in common and they're all based on some principles. So for example, it could be scanning and the network. It can be uh, finding vulnerabilities and misconfigurations in my instance. Uh, and it could be moni monitoring and logging events based on some predefined rules. So what you're trying to tell us is despite me constantly referring to it as the cloud irresponsibility responsibility model, there you go, irresponsibility model, that I'm wrong because with all of these tools, cloud security, we got this. Yes, but... There are so many tools and in theory, we can get them all and enable everything, but that's not the case because uh, first of all, these tools cost money and sometimes a lot of money. If you enable all the configurations on all the data and everything, it costs a lot of money. So probably your boss is not going to be super happy about it. <laughs> Second, uh, we have to configure these tools. We can, we have to configure them in the right way that fits our organization and it's not a easy and not an easy task and lastly as we will see attackers still find a way to bypass our tools so we're not fully protected okay so fine you're saying that with all of these tools and all of the confusion that we have and i mean i will grant that one of the biggest issues too is that every security tool is available in a different format by a different cloud provider it might be under a different name or conclude different things so as we're transitioning and overwhelming ourselves and driving us crazy cloud security attackers got this exactly so an example of a very sophisticated attack uh, discovered by Sophos researchers. 
Uh, what happened there is there was a, uh, an environment including of AWS in Linux AWS instances, and the researchers discovered that a very sophisticated threat actor managed to piggyback command and control traffic uh, on the legitimate traffic and bypassing a very well configured AWS firewall. And the way they were uh, able to do that is they used a rootkit that actually intercepted the networking in the kernel level, so it's really sophisticated and not easy to do. And by that, they managed, first of all, to communicate with a command and control server that sat somewhere in the world outside the, in the environment. And moreover, they were able to drop a rat into the system. And what is interesting about this um, malware, about this rat, is that um, based on code analysis, they saw that it was based on a rat called Ghost, Ghost with an O, with a zero instead of O. <laughs> and um, it initially targeted only Windows, but here it uh, ran on Linux machines. So first of all, we, we see a multi-platform malware, a rat that shifted from Windows to Linux. It's not clear if the threat actors that uh, launched the attack, they were the ones that developed the Linux version or it was existing somewhere and they just used it. But the fact remains is that a sophisticated threat actor got bypassed the firewall, the well-configured AWS firewall and dropped a multi-platform malware. I, I want to interrupt here because I, sorry, <laughs> is so Cloud Snooper is currently one of my favorite pieces of, you know, just my favorite attack to you know, really go over. And just so you all know, I just remembered there's a white paper on it written by Sophos. I'll make sure to link to that as well. And if anyone from Sophos is listening, hi, I'm El. I've said it in every single talk I've given. I'd love to collaborate and talk to you about it. But did you hear that part about how it was written, you know, around Ghost? And this was malware that was out before this attack occurred. Malware that we knew how it behaved, that we knew what it was, that was open source, so we had the ability to play with it, yet it still was able to get past our traditional, you know, uh, scanning. It was able to get past our traditional antivirus when it came to, um, when it came to signatures or behavior. And the fact that it was in the cloud, eh, it didn't even impact it. It was written to be able to bypass these cloud security methods. So once again, it's not working. All right, go ahead, Nicole, take this back to uh, Windows malware targeting Linux. So yeah, actually we prepared a few examples of uh, malware that we previously saw targeting Windows and now we saw artifacts in um, targeting Linux. So first of all is IPStorm. So IPStorm was initially discovered by researchers at Anomaly. Uh, they saw this new malware written in Go and targeting Windows. But uh, later, last year, our research team discovered new variants of the malware written in Go, targeting Linux and actually uh, other services and IoT devices, Android, and even we found a macOS sample. And we found a few new features, including SSH uh, spreading and to other instances and so on. And another thing that we were able to do is find code similarities. So. Our company, Intezer, has a very strong and powerful uh, technology to analyze code and see where it was uh, used before, whether it's a trusted um, software or a malicious or a malware sample, and classify which is what and uh, where it was seen before. So that's how we were able to link the code from the Linux sample to the code from the Windows sample, and we saw that it shared a lot of code. So I'm going to step in as what I usually do real quick. I love to interrupt Nicole. By the way, if y'all haven't figured that out. So as part of my job was to translate researcher to stuff that we know. Basically, what the research team was able to do is say, hey, this new piece of malware that we're seeing shares the same code with malware A, malware B, malware C, malware that we've already known about, malware that a lot of times have been open sourced, but yet we're still missing it. Okay. I'll interrupt you again later. Feel free. <laughs> so what I wanted to say is that when we picked up the first sample uh, that targeted Linux, it was actually undetected by any other uh, security vendor on virus total. So all the other vendors uh, initially missed it. Probably now it will be well detected. But the fact, as I'll mention, is that we see this shift 
from Windows to Linux, and sometimes it's really hard to detect it. All right. Uh... I have included, sorry, I'm moving my power because it didn't get connected to my laptop and that's now flashing at me. Um, so I will add a link to that within our uh, resource page. And I looked at it this morning, Nicole, no. All of the virus, to, uh, all the search engines, detection engines on virus total are still not picking it up. And I added, hopefully y'all have had a chance to read this tweet while I went into that. But I found this picture of this duck and was like, I have to use this in some sort of talk. And so I went into our analyzed database and I looked up duck and guess what? There was a piece of malware that worked with it. This is how frequently there are new pieces of malware that you can pick an animal and we can search for it and it exists. So while Nicole was sleeping, I rewrote half of this talk to include lemon duck. And what do you know? It was also a piece of malware that was cross-platform. So uh, how did you enjoy uh, finding out about this uh, change in the talk, Nicole? Well, this was amazing. I woke up on Friday morning and saw all these tweets and I didn't understand what happened. <laughs> there was so a duck. <laughs> I didn't think. And I did a thing. So, okay. I love this piece of malware because it's going to be your friend. I mean, look at this duck. This duck is awesome. He's friendly, just like Lemon Duck the malware, because it, what it does, right, after it gets on your system, it goes and does your sysadmin job and your security job. It hardens that system. It makes sure that you have all the updates going. It makes sure that you have the right ports. They do an amazing job of making sure that no one else can get into your system. After all, if they found it, more than likely, somebody else is going to find it. So when we're talking about these evil attacks, just remember that happy duck. Okay, let's take a look at the analysis when it comes to it. And I've just recently started getting into, you know, DFIR and all of this understanding. And this is absolutely fascinating to me because, and Colby, you can push the button one more time. Look at how many different pieces of malware, variants of malware, right? Every single time that they change even the smallest change uh, within the code, within what, what functionality they're bringing in, they've changed the signature and they've changed its behavior. And now we've even changed the operating system that we're looking at. I mean, you can see the transition to Golang there, meaning, you know what, our traditional defenses, like hopefully I've made the point and showed you step by step how they don't matter. They just aren't effective. And we actually had the opportunity, we being the researchers at Inazur, and you know, I just lumped myself into them, to watch an attacker put in one piece of one like version of a malware and it get high detection. A little bit later, there's a second piece, lower detection. A little bit later, a new variant, low detection, until they were able to get the smallest detection, I guess, that they wanted. And then they started using it. This is not something that is abnormal. It's something that we should prepare for in our every single day security posture. But I'm not gonna leave you hanging on that as much as I love that duck. Um, in the next slide, Nicole, please, which will be available, of course, we're giving you the CVEs that were being used along with information on how you can protect your system. Folks, look at this. This attack is actively occurring now, is still effective, and it's using Eternal Blue. How long have we known about that? How long have there been controversies about that? And we're still allowing it to happen. Okay, so uh, Nicole, the attackers are coming, right? Yes, they're coming. And there are multiple ways in which they can come. Uh, we call them attack vectors, uh, methods by which attackers can breach the system. So there are several of them. Uh, we will mention a few. First of all, we have the misconfigurations. So misconfigurations happen in the cloud because the cloud is a complex system because we have different instances and different services that they have to communicate with each other and we have to configure them. And on top of that all, we have different users that need to have different permissions because not everyone should access everything. So we have a lot of things to keep in mind. So misconfigurations happens because we are human and we make mistakes. But sometimes these mistakes can be really bad results, I would say. So for instance, last um, month, we published a, write, um, sorry, a blog about Airflow, a misconfigured Airflow. So Airflow is the most popular open source platform for workflows. Workflow uh, is meant to automate tasks. What happened is that we discovered 
many, many, many uh, exposed instances of airflow and the companies that owned these instances misconfigured them and exposed them. But not only that, they exposed their credentials, their keys, their tokens for applications, for services and so on. Basically, anyone that scanned for the specific ports could, uh, in theory, find the, the information. And that's really not good. <laughs> Another way in which attackers can get into the system is using vulnerabilities. So, as we saw in the in Lemon Duck, we have lots of vulnerabilities to different uh, services and softwares. Usually, once a vulnerability is reported to the soft software provider, a patch will be released and we must, seriously, we must update the, the software and patch all the vulnerabilities. Yay, we're getting to, you folks knew it was coming. You cannot have a talk this day and age without supply chain attacks and solar winds. So Cole, tell us something new that we don't know about solar winds. No, we're not going to talk about solar winds again, <laughs> not again. I don't know how to unmute myself. Okay, so Nicole alluded to it earlier when we were talking about the Reevil Gang. It uh, this is really a way for us to be able to see into the mentality of an attacker because we've actually had it referred to as the solar winds of ransomware. So there you go. I put in the solar winds for us. And what was really interesting about this attack is it was really thought out about when it would actually occur. I mean, we had the network of at least 200 companies compromised on a Friday. And in the US, it was the Friday before the 4th of July. So eh, you kind of check out the day before your holiday. So in a sense, it was about a four day weekend and the companies were on skeleton crews. This was attributed to a Russian speaking um, ransomware syndicate. And unless they have specifically claimed attribution, just put supposedly in front of everything with kind of italics text because attribution, we don't do it lightly. It, the criminals um, actually were able to target a software supplier. And you know, there we go, this is the whole supply chain again. And it was using you know, network management configuration and packages. This is happening so many times. And we've even had the Linux kernel, we've had Apache, um, HTTP actually compromised. And many of them can't actually tell you what occurred. If there's any developers on the line, let me just tell you Node.js. And if you're not a developer, go look up Node.js vulnerabilities. And there is your Halloween story for uh, for the week and maybe for the month if you get scared. This was, um, according to one of my friends, Jake, one of the, uh, sorry, <laughs> Malware Jake is the way that you all may know him, is basically an attack that really gave you visibility into the way that attackers were you know, going to continue to attack. This was not happenstance that they planned it within these days. So as security teams, we really need to find a way to be ready to actually dig into what's going to occur even before we can think of it occurring. Like, does that make sense? Even when we're on skeleton crews, even if it's one person that's on the floor, we need to have the tools and the knowledge to know exactly how to react. Right? What is the average payout when it comes to search of these attacks? Well, we're looking at about half a million dollars. Button. <laughs> okay. And 73% of these attacks were successful. Let me say that one again. Of the attacks that are being launched, 73% of these attacks are successful. That number within itself, not looking at anything else, should tell you the fact that something needs to change. And I swear we did not pay him. We actually do not know him. But uh, Dimitri from Network Computing said that the issue is that there is absolutely no last line of defense when it comes to these types of attacks. Nicole and I are here to strongly disagree with him. So Nicole, you tried to get it in during our promo video and I, doing what I do best, interrupted you. Fine, give them what the missing piece of cloud security really is. So the missing piece, the big reveal is runtime protection. So first um, of all- <laughs> <laughs> Not exciting, right? <laughs> What's runtime? <laughs> 
well runtime uh, think of it like you have a program on your computer on your pc you click it and the window is opened right what happens behind the scenes is basically that the file that contain this program is loaded into the cpu and in this moment it's called a process what runtime protection solutions do they scan all the processes or all the loaded processes into memory and scan them for artifacts of malware now you might think i mean if we're scanning the runtime it means that the malware is already executed so why would i want it i want to stop it before and makes total sense but the thing is that malware becomes more sophisticated and in some ways it may be even easier sometimes to make the malware more sophisticated because we have more open source tools and so on so why do you need runtime protection is because it's your last line of defense it means that all the other mechanisms and tools fail to detect the malware when it was dropped to the computer when it was as a file and now with runtime protection a good a tool would be able to terminate the malware as soon as it starts to execute and maybe it will save you from further damage. So why is it important? I think I can sum it up really quick. This is what you think you look like with your security posture. This is what at the bottom there, what you actually look like to an attacker. So I can't give this up. Nicole, bring us back to Lemon Duck, please show the screen and Lemon Duck Look, it's a perfect example for everything. I will continue to use it because, next screen please, when it comes to that whole concept of runtime protection, right? When the first instance of Lemon Duck came out, it was malware that we might not have seen before. However, it was malware that we could have, if we were monitoring that, known had shared malicious libraries. So even if it was able to bypass, the attacker was able to bypass our network perimeter and they were able to breach our systems. Look, breaches happen. We need to be prepared for that. When you were monitoring the code that is running on your system, then you know, it could have been, even if there were not changes when the behavior of the server, it could have been caught. And one of the issues that we fall into with security teams is we basically give over the monitoring of our host systems to sysads, meaning that unless they're able to see a change in the behavior, whether it be high CPU, whatever it is, they're not going to catch it until they see that server over and over again. Because a former, as a former sysad, I can tell you that if that high proc U usage alert closes down before I get to it, eh, it was probably something the developer did. Close it and move it on. So it's not until I see that server a hundred times that I go, wait a minute, I should probably look into this. I keep seeing that server's name. Then we run into the issue that I've been discussing before. Nicole, one more time. And that's once attackers know that it's effectively working, know that it's getting in there, then let's start changing what it's doing. You know what? We want to go into crypto miner, uh, crypto mining because that profit, right? That's what attacks are about. So we break in XM rig miner and cool. We're able to get a new variant. We're able to change the behavior. We're able to change what we get. But now that's kind of being caught. We're not getting what we want. So let's add another miner into it. You know, uh, I'm not going to go into Blue Mockingbird. I can link to it, but yeah, I'm going to do a talk with just animals. But basically what I'm trying to say is the last line of defense needs to be on the concept of breach already happening, right? We need to assume that the attacker is already on the system and they are already going to launch that code. Let's go ahead and move past this traditional base antivirus, the traditional base signature and behavioral base, and even network based perimeter and build our last line. It's that whole concept of defense in depth, but somehow we right now tend to stop at the server, even if it's on prem or the cloud. Okay. So, Nicole, uh, being the wonderful researcher that you are, I think you can show this firsthand on how an attack works, right? Sure. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Let the sorry. demo god be with us. Live, man. We're just going to do it live. Oh, and I'm God. hanging out on the Discord channel if anybody has any questions or funny comments about, you know, Lemon Duck or Blue, uh, Blue Jay. <laughs> All right. I think we're okay. ready to go. 
You, you see it, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> okay. So what we did here, uh, we ran a Docker with an uh, image that we have. So we'll say that it's uh, our own image of our organization uh, with some interesting uh, things that we need for, to run our code. And let's say it hosted on some repository uh, for images and we're running this uh, Redis service. And it seems that everything is okay, right? We have the Redis, it's running, I can connect to it. Yay. But the thing is, we will open our dashboard. We see an infection. So this is Protect. Um, <laughs> Protect is a product by Intezer for runtime protection on Linux uh, systems. And it's a lot, it gives you visibility for all the code that is running, including inside containers. So we have these two alerts. Oh, sorry. We have these two alerts for a uh, file, a smaller and malicious file. Interesting. And we see it's an XM rig minor. You can uh, scroll down and see more details to understand what happened. Why do we have these alerts? And as you can see, it runs inside a container with our image. So basically, uh, what we see here is an example of an attacker that got access to our, our uh, repo and uh, sabotaged our image. And now it's a malicious image. And once we run it as a container, malware is executed inside our container, inside our environment. And for us, the users, everything seems fine, right? Because we have the Redis and we even don't know that malware is executed if we don't have a runtime protection. And from here, we can actually terminate the malware and stop the process. We don't want to leave that running on our system. We might get in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to uh, interrupt as I do best really quick and let you guys know, like, this isn't a product pitch. It's just the tool that we need to know how to, that we know how to use. So please, you know, go and investigate and look to see what tools it is that your company needs. Um, but just know this, you need runtime protection. Please, 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 if you're implementing a product, think about the alerts that it may create. Because if we're seeing high product, a high proc usage every time that your server is run, you're just going to create more servers run, processes are run, you're going, scanner, the scanner is run. You're going to run into having a mountain of alerts that's going to mean that runtime protection isn't going to be helping you if you never get to the runtime itself. Um, that's our advice to you is what do you need to do for, and I will say this like this, the love of God, patch all the things, patch your system, patch the stuff on your network, patch your servers, patch your applications. And if you're rolling your eyes saying, I thought we were going to get new advice, why are you giving us the same old thing? Because you're still getting compromised due to servers not being patched. As a part of the cloud, we have this fallacy that our cloud providers are always going to provide us the best patched systems. No, because there is a line that you have to go through, right? They want to give you stability. And if they automatically patch things, what happens if it breaks your application? Um, I'm just going to give a different piece of advice that isn't in here, but it completely just reminded me of it is well, I guess it is. My bad. Nicole's amazing with adding things after she hears me uh, rant. What the missing piece, and I know we said it was runtime protection, but what it all comes down to in the end with runtime protection, with everything that we've said, it's all about visibility. So maybe visibility wasn't missing. It was just turned over when we were putting our puzzle together. You need to know your environment. And this becomes pretty close to impossible without the right tools when it comes to the cloud. Think about it. How often are servers going up and down when it comes to having that continuous deployment pipeline? How often are pushes occurring? Then we have containers inside of that that are going up and down within, mo within minutes, within seconds. And then we've got automation in place. Hey, that server, you know, it really wasn't working the way it should. So automation says, you know what, delete it and put a new one in its place. Or it says, Windows the issue, turn it off and turn it on again. How much information did you just lose there? Nicole talked about fileless malware. 
This is malware that occurs strictly within memory, meaning that nothing is ever written to disk. Many times meaning that we don't get the logs generated that we would need to in order to investigate. And even if the logs were in, uh, put in place, the server is gone now or it's been turned on and off again. By knowing our environment, we're able to put closer um, security around it. We're able to make sure that we're monitoring the right thing. Much too often or too often, I see security, specifically us for the security team, put in place at the network level, and we just continuously develop walls around us. But in the case such as Cloud Snooper, the attackers, they are you know, developers. They are, they've probably worked within Blue Team, to be honest with you. They know the methods that we're using. We can't protect what we can't see. Know your code. When it comes to this whole shift left to the cloud, all of the responsibility and has just been handed over to the developers. And we say, okay, well, we're shifting security left too. I spoke to a group of developers who basically showed me how you can automate bypassing security uh, testing because security teams, they don't know their tools, they don't know what they're talking about, and they're holding up the development cycle. Both your devs, probably your ops, and your security team need to know what's supposed to be occurring on that system. We can't rely on traditional you know, monitoring when it comes to behavioral base because did we configure it every single time to adapt to what the code is supposed to be doing on our uh, supposed to be doing within our cloud? We need to know the threat. Without understanding the threat, it's very difficult to build the defenses around them. Um, one of the and yes, I'm bringing it up again. One of the threat actors that you need to look at, and Nicole and I can disagree whether it's an APT or not, is Team TNT. They are specifically transitioning to their attacks when it comes to focusing on uh, crypto miners. And Nicole, I'm gonna stop here and let you talk about the threat and the threat's abilities, because I think that's a lot of what you do on the research team. Yes, so in the past year, I think we really um, analyzed um, their capabilities. So Team TNT are, uh, interesting threat actor because they're targeting, they started from Redis and they then shifted um, to Docker and Kubernetes and they're probably going to shift again to a uh, new services that can be misconfigured or, or vulnerable. And uh, their main thing that they're doing, they actually drop crypto miners using a misconfiguration, they're targeting um, relatively low hanging fruits and their attacks consist of scripts, many, many scripts. So sometimes it's really uh, could be harder to detect the threat. And only uh, we see the malware, the crypto mining that is running and not uh, the actual scripts that led to the execution. I mean, you say scripts. I mean, like, it's exactly what we talked about, right? They're starting to rely on, well, really, even from the beginning, their tactic has been to rely on fileless malware. Um, not from the beginning, but in some point they did uh, make a shift. They starting to use an open source tool called Isuri, written in Golang, and uh, it enables them to use fileless malware. So basically, they pack their malware using an open source tool and deliver this uh, um, file. And once it was execu executed, the malware was fileless, meaning that uh, there was no actual malicious file on the system and the malware was executed in the runtime. And that's the only place where you could uh, catch it. I talked earlier about, you know, attribution isn't given easily, but um, I, I should have linked on it, but Team TNT is very active on Twitter and they will respond back to researchers and what they're seeing. So we can tell you definitely that these are the methods that they're using because they're very proud of it. And it's kind of cool. They've actually tweeted at our research team as well. So if you want to keep up with how these attacks are transitioning, this is an attacker that you want to keep your eye on um, because they're going to tell you whether they did something or not. All right, back to our points here. Um, Visibility into your security is key. I Look, I've worked in the security industry. I, I've worked here for a while and I love our policy of we're gonna have this white binder with every policy that we're gonna do and exactly how we should handle it and who's gonna go where. 
okay, but what, the first time we're introduced to it is when we have a junior sysad that runs and grabs the binder and pulls it open and starts going over what you're going to do. You get an alert. You know that there is an attacker on the system. You have monitoring in place that tells you what that's actually doing. You know, more than likely, based on what, you know, the indicators, what threat you're looking at. What's the next step? That next step can't be go get the binder. You need to have collaboration within your team's visibility to know what you're going to do and not just have it hang while somebody goes and grabs a manager. All right, let's sum this all up. The big takeaways that I want you to have within this, patch your system, patch your system, patch your system. Did I mention patch your system? From there, know what's going on in your environment, know what's running within it, collaborate with one another, if I haven't brought that up enough. And really, it is not going to be one solution. I know we laugh at that concept of defense in depth. The issue is that we're not going deep enough. It's as simple as that. And with that, um, I think we've entertained you all enough, right? Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. I know we said a lot. So if afterwards you're thinking, oh, wait, I should have thought this, or they didn't go into clarity here, both Nicole and I are active on Twitter. I live on there, so feel free to reach out to us. You can email us, and all of those resources that we talked about will be at elopunk.com slash Hankoff. If you if I miss something or you want more, then just email me and I'll put it on there. All right. That is all we got. Thank you so much, moderator, for coming back. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for, the, for this talk. This is a very painful talk for me. Uh, I've been an occasional Ruby on Rails contributor and I have introduced like dozens of CVEs. Like seriously, so much of them. I, I don't want to admit that. Um, <laughs> Wait, wait, I have an interesting fact for you. When it comes to CVEs, we're looking at an average about 50 a day coming out. Yeah. And this year, 400 of them were called the worst of the worst to ever be seen. Yeah, well, one of the, my last contributions was uh, middleware that uh, protects against DNS uh, rebinding attacks. And this by itself had like six CVEs, at least, maybe more. Uh, so yeah, security, security is very hard. Um, so you were talking about this runtime protection. Is that something that lives in the kernel? How do we get it all the time? And uh, yeah, I, I, how do we get this runtime protection? How how can we? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll start it, and Nicole, you can add to it. Uh, runtime protection, all it really is, is know what code is running on your system at that time. So you put in monitoring that looks for code itself that we know to be malicious. So there are sets of malicious libraries that are out there. We have the code to a lot of malware because it's been open sourced. So let's say you're looking at something, and you're going, hmm, this process that's running is like 50% code that's similar to Mirai. You know, maybe this is a thing that we should look into, not after the fact, what did it do? Um, Mirai is the one that I mentioned because it was open source, what, in 2016, and we still see code from it being effective. Uh, Nicole, you can probably give a more technical answer to that. Um, I just wanted to add that if you're asking from a perspective of uh, how do you develop something like that. So yes, there are different solutions. It could be a kernel model uh, or an agent that uh, sits and uh, listens for system calls, audited logs, and so on. So uh, there are different uh, solutions uh, for this uh, protection. Yeah, thank you. And um, would you recommend automation? for our world because, you know, we're mostly web, app, web devs around here. Like uh, our apps run on like servers or even more. They don't run on servers anymore. They, were, they run on Kubernetes, they run on pods. They, they use Docker images. So we have so many dependencies like all across the board in our infrastructure, in our code. So all of this can be vulnerable. Uh, should we keep on it on eye? Do we, do we have some automation? Like how, how do we keep ourselves safe? <laughs> automation is it's funny, it's a double edged sword because it would enable, it's what enables us to be things like first to market, right? To bring products out as quickly as possible. And yes, we can even have automation help us with our patching, but we're automating. I always say that we now have ops as a service because we're automating what should be actually handled by an individual. Automation is great, but 
it, there needs to be a person behind it. There needs to somebody, there needs to be somebody that understands exactly what's occurring because when something breaks, how long is it going to take you to deal with automation and then get to the problem itself? Uh, Nicole, I know that you've done some Devi stuff. So what do you think? I totally agree. I mean, automation is great. Uh, for sure, it can help you. Um, but sometimes, yeah, you need to, you need to be there. A person needs to be there. Hey, uh, Nicole, I I'm going to bring it up. I use this example so much be uh, because Nicole was a part of it and she's going to roll her eyes. But like, here we go, Nicole, Docky. <laughs> Docky was a great reason that you can't rely on automation because you would have, you know, a container spin up. Docky by itself didn't have any malicious code to it. So nothing was actually caught in your pre runtime scanning, your automation scanning when it comes to containers. And while it was in there, it used the curl command to pull down the malicious packet. Think about how quickly containers go up and down. Could you actually catch that or would your automation just continue to push that throughout your, you know, your environment? Yeah, so it uh, really depends on the tool. So uh, sometimes automation can help you and sometimes you just need to be a little bit, uh, think one step in, uh, before in advance. Cool, cool. Thanks so much uh, for this talk again. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here in, at HackConf. And yeah, yeah, thanks so much.